a very good morning, afternoon and evening to all of you. I'm here doing parliamentary ponderings with someone extremely, extremely parliamentary. And I present to you the Honourable, Right Honourable Speaker, John Burkham. Good Welcome. morning. Thank you, Marley, and good morning to you. Top of the morning. <laughs> good to see Although you. Although for some people it may be afternoon Absolutely. or evening, depending on what part of the globe Absolutely. they're situated at present. It's a pleasure to see you. Same here. I'm um, sitting here with uh, not just John Burkle, but the longest serving, the longest serving uh, post war speaker of the UK House of Commons. It's a real pleasure to you. Thank you. And um, let me just share with you, all of you might most probably know him already, but let me just share with you a few things about him. Of course, John was elected four times to the House of Commons. He's the longest uh, post war speaker, 10 years, in the UK House of Commons. And, um, his constituency was Buckingham. Buckingham. That's right. Just towards the Midlands. Okay. South East of England towards the Midlands. And he's had 10 parliamentary awards. Is that right? Yes, I was fortunate over the years to get Tell us a little bit about that. various activities. Well, I suppose I started out as a member of parliament, very keen really, Marby, to make my mark as a backbencher. People often think that somebody goes into politics must aspire to be prime minister or in fact, I didn't. I thought very much in terms of being a decent local representative of my constituency and as somebody who wanted to champion the causes in which I believed. So I was very focused on activity in the chamber. And some of the early awards that I was fortunate to win were in recognition of my activity as what I would call a backbench inquisitor. That is to say, I was an ordinary backbencher, questioning, probing, scrutinizing, challenging, contradicting, trying to expose the errors of omission and commission of the government of the day. Later, I was fortunate to win awards for my work as speaker. So really, it was for a number of different things, including championing the rights of minorities, which is something we probably feature well, in our discussions. And we're both passionate about Absolute. the rights of the women, vulnerable. but also the rights of minorities, right. people who are vulnerable, people who've been subject to harassment, intimidation, exclusion, disadvantage in one form or another. So I feel that this is a case of East and West Absolute. meeting, Absolute. and us having, ever since we first met five years ago, when you Shared awarded me with the House of Commons I Democracy Award, my big Democracy Award. Absolutely. You got, I'm so excited I, about I it. think everybody should know that you got the House of Commons Democracy Award in 2017. Yes. And that was because the panel that I chaired that made the decision thought that your story of fighting for people who needed a yeah. voice was a very impressive story. You were fighting very often in difficult and challenging circumstances. And your trademarks were your eloquence and your absolute indefatigability. That concept of indefatigability is a characteristic of yours. And yours too. Being kind enough to say yours it's too. Absolutely, that, that notion of hanging in there, sticking at it, refusing to move, insisting. Well, that's what you that need to do in politics. Our don't cause you? is just precisely. I think that. What you just said is very important. That's what you have to do in politics. In that sense, I sometimes feel that politics is perhaps to be contrasted with, say, academia. Now, there may be academics listening who say this is wrong, but at least in theory, in academia, if somebody shows you that your argument is wrong, that there's a, a fault in your thesis, either because of your methodology or your reasoning or analysis or interpretation of the evidence, and it's absolutely clear that you have made a mistake. Well, you have to go away and reconsider your thesis. Not necessarily abandon it altogether, but certainly amend it and so on. By contrast, I think in politics, people tend to make the same arguments, whether they're right or wrong, over and over and over. And whether they're in the UK or in Pakistan or any part of the world, I think. Yes, we have a lot in common yes. politicians all over the world. Yeah, I don't, I don't think, think it's a Pakistani a, phenomenon. Or it's not a a phenomenon West or East. Or American phenomenon. No. It's not West or East, exactly. It's global. Yeah. And so, in other words, people have their hobby horses, if you like. Right. People have their chosen causes, people have their pet arguments, people have their lines that they trot out over and over and over again. And I suppose my attitude always was, well, if other people are going to trot out their lines, I've got to be ready to fight back and to make my case, to insist on my point of view, and to keep going until victory was achieved. And so, 
that, I think, is at least as important as having good arguments. And obviously, people have good arguments, and it's a matter of sort of intellectual self respect. You want to have good quality arguments. But it's a great mistake to think that if you've made a good point once, well, that's it. Game, set, match, all yeah. one. You know from your experience, Marvin, that you just have to keep going, you have to keep Persistent. working, keep persuading people, yeah. you have to find allies, you've got to identify new ways of getting your messages across. It's so the same in business, isn't it? Message. I think it is. I think also that perhaps like in business. Because I have a business background. Stand, yeah, I don't have a business background in the way that you do, but I, I sort of feel really that in the commercial world and in the political world, there's not much by way of standing still. In other words, you're either advancing mm. absolutely or relatively to your competitors, or sooner or later, you're going to regress, you're going to go backwards. I'll tell you why I mentioned that, John. Yeah, sorry to interrupt, but I'll tell you why I mentioned that. I mean, my career started off with three bank, as, as I shared with you. And I learned corporate management, and that was really, like straight after the LSD, straight after that. I think that was a very critical moment in my life where I was you know, taught management. And that helped me throughout my career. So whether I went from there, I went on to you know, um, start an um, um, entrepreneurial business. First, first time fleet management satellite tracking in Pakistan, uh, a company I was associated with. I set it up as a CEO, etc. Um, and then even when I was advisor to President Sharaf, right? and, and beyond that in Parliament as a, or even before that as advisor on investments. So wherever I have been in my career, whether it's on the corporate side, the business, or the city bank, or whether it's on the political side, Parliament, or with working with the president, I have found that the traits that I picked up at, at city bank, I always say that, have been really critical for me. They've helped me all along uh, because they've kept me focused, they've kept me running, uh, and they've kept me on track. You know? Yes, I think that's quite significant. In other words, what you're really saying is that your business career was a formative I think influence so. on that's you. The, that's now, what differentiates me, perhaps, from other politicians out there uh, who didn't have that management training. You know, to keep things uh, in the right boxes and such. Focus. But coming to politics, let me ask you: Why did why did you join politics, John? Well, of course, the fashionable answer. Answer. Let's see if both of us have the same fashionable answer well, to fashion, serve the people. The fashionable is that answer right? is to serve the, the people. people. Absolutely. The people lives of people in my but community what's the real to serve the national Yeah, I mean, the whole of UK and the whole Actually, of the world knows that, but what's the real reason? Uh, the, the real reason why I opted for politics in the first instance was that I was an ambitious little brother who wanted to get on. That's the truth. That's what you said in the book as well. Literally. Yes, I think that you know, quite often people like to invest their careers with very noble motives. And in some cases that may be true. There are people who are hugely motivated by the call of public service. And of course, when I set out on a career in politics, I did want to do a good job. I wanted to serve my constituents effectively, and I wanted to be an honest and effective and articulate and persuasive representative. But if I'm really candid with you and our listeners, I didn't start out thinking, I want to leave Buckingham at the end of my tenure better in X, Y, Z, D, P, R, S, T, mm. respect. I didn't. I thought, I want to be an MP. I want to make my mark. I want to be heard. Mm. I want to be recognized mm. as the next mm. capable. I'm glad you're being honest. And similarly, I think it would be true to say that I didn't have a great aspiration to be a minister. Oh, you did? Still less prime minister. No, but I really wanted to be known for my own ability. Mm -hmm. I don't think at the start I conceptualized my career in terms of thinking, these are the differences I'd like to bring about. These are the changes mm -hmm. I'd like to deliver. These are the respects in which I want my community, mm -hmm. my country, the world to be better as a result of John Berkeley. What I was really thinking about is how can John Berkeley get on? How can I get a leg up? And I think to some extent that is perhaps a reflection of coming from a lower middle class background and on my father's side originally with my grandparents, a refugee background. Mm. My 
grandparents came over on the onion boat from Romania in the early part of the century. I've been so century. proud of you. And, you know, I suppose in a sense, I like to think they might have been proud. I thought, well, I want to get on. Mm. I want to show what I'm capable of achieving. What happened in my case was that later, rather later, once I was already in Parliament, mm. and particularly I think after I'd been re-elected in 2001, I thought, well, what's the motive? What's the purpose? What's it all about? Mm. What am I actually trying to achieve beyond So that part the came whilst you were in Parliament? Very much so. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not particularly proud of this, but I think no, that we're being honest. these broadcasts is best to be candid. Absolutely, and that's what um, people want to hear. Not to pretend to people what I'm We're not in Parliament and we're not in politics. No, so left, we can speak our mind. I've left Parliament. I've retired yes. now. I had a and your book is called career. Unspeakable in My many ways. book is called Unspeakable, which is intended to sound a note of self deprecation, so to speak. Some people think I am unspeakable, but. I Are we not all buses. unspeakable in terms of politicians and parliamentarians at some point? You know, I think we are. And unlike you, I think it's quite interesting, Marvin, you talked about how your management training mm. and your business career had influenced the way you went about your politics yeah. and probably imparted to you disciplines of organization. good organisation, mm. strategic planning, focus and stuff. I can't honestly say that was true in my case. I think it would be more accurate to say, in my case, that although I was not a successful sportsman in terms of winning medals or anything like that, I was a very competitive junior tennis player. And from a very early age, from the age of eight onwards, I think I did show myself in my sport as an indomitable spirit. That is to say, I was a real fighter. I wasn't particularly talented, but I was a real fighter. And I remember at one point a, a coach, quite a well-known coach in London, who didn't teach me, he taught a number of other people, went up to my mother when I had just won a very long, tiring match. And he said, Mrs. Burko, I don't think your son is the most talented player on the junior circuit. I've seen people with said that. greater ability in terms of shot making and so on. But I want to say two things to you. First, I wish some of my players in my stable had the absolute determination that John brings to the court. It's very obvious that, that he in is politics. completely prepared to stay on the court for two hours, three hours, four hours, however long it takes mm -hmm. to come off a winner. And secondly, he said, your son is prepared to run and run and run and run and run. He'll run forever. Mm -hmm. Some of my players are more talented, but they're a bit lazy. Mm. So I think that that's indefatigability yeah. helped me a little bit in Absolutely. tennis. I won more matches. No, but even in politics. But I think it's helped me in politics. Right. I intended just to take the view that, you know, a defeat or a setback. Or and we've got plenty of those in our political career. You have step. ups and downs. You know, these are just you win some, wins. you lose some. Yeah, they're just flesh wins, and you just carry yeah. on. You know, you just keep going. If you think you've got I have a few stories on this sports ground. I started off with hockey, which is Pakistan's favourite. Well, Pakistan's favorite other well, cricket Apart is the favourite. <laughs> but yeah, I cricket think you're is a good the, cricketer. Well. No, I'm not completely not. Uh, but yeah, I played hockey as uh, in the British School of Paris in my secondary schooling, and um, I wasn't I wasn't particularly amazing at it, but I was persistent. Uh, I was terrible as a goalkeeper, but I was okay as a left half. But you know, these are things that we don't normally discuss. But it's nice to talk about them. I, I, I was, you know, coming back to, um, I mean, why, why we all join politics. Why I wanted, did you go in? Yeah, what? I want to share a little bit. Mine was very, very specific. I mean, it comes from my name. My name is Marvi, Marvi in the right Sindhi pronunciation, Sindhi from Pakistan, um, and um, and it means daughter of the soil. And it's the daughter of the song. And, um, and it's a story by one of the most incredible, famous, incredibly famous and incredible uh, Sufi saints of the world. His name is uh, Shah Abdul Nabi Kitai. Uh, he's from Sindh, Pakistan. But he belongs to the world. And his concept was very clear. He talked about seven in his poetry. He talked about he promoted Islam, but through his poetry. And he focused in on seven women. So it was always women in power. And one of the, her, his heroines, or his sulmis as we call them, was Madhi. And um, so the, the idea really was that I kind of embraced that. I embraced that Sufi spirit. I embraced the politics of it, meaning the mission of it. And I was very stuck on this is the mission. This is the goal. I need to 
not just serve my people, but I need to help the vulnerable. Um, and so it was always a question of helping the vulnerable. Now, how do you help the vulnerable? There are different ways of helping the vulnerable, you know? So, I mean, I might have started off on, in the opposition venture. So I was not a backbencher, John. I was completely, um, uh, I mean, I, I think I was uh, a nightmare for the prime minister. I almost say that. And, but they were super, super patient with me in my were office. Were you motivated in any way by parental influence? I think so. I think my dad, he's been there. Um, he's been a minister three times uh, for information. He's been a senator. So I had that background. He's been on the corporate side. He's been on in IBM. Um, so yeah, and it was very focused. But since he had given me that name, that name always stuck with me that somehow I had to deliver good to the vulnerable. Now, how do you deliver good to the vulnerable? The best way I thought was, hey, let's jump into parliament. I got an opportunity because of President Musharraf, for which I'm grateful. And um, I started my career with PMLQ as a political party. They were in uh, opposition in those days. So I had a fantastic time. I, I used to, I mean, calling attention notices and resolutions and, and you know, adjournment motions by the hundreds on yes. a daily basis. I yes. mean, the, the, the office of the National Assembly, they were up to there. How can someone produce 100 per day? But I had a little machine That's gun. That's very revealing. Is it? What you just said is very revealing, Marvin, and that's another point of interest and yeah. similarity between us. Your eyes almost lit up as you said you were not <laughs> in government, you were in opposition. Yes. And you then talked about you know, the level of your yes. prodigious parliamentary labour set, yes. this enormous output in terms of tabling motions oh, yeah. and putting down motions sure. and stuff. Now, and the bills as well. The only bills. two made it to success, we'll talk about that. Yes, but you know I think it's it less a question of how many reach the statute book and more relevant to focus on the fact that you undertook yes. that activity on a regular basis. And I suppose the point I'm making, which may be of interest to our listeners, is this. Although people normally want, when they get elected, mm. to be in a situation where their party's in government, actually, mm. for a newbie, yeah, it's best or to an start ingenue, in opposition. it's better to start in yeah, opposition. Absolutely. Because the truth of the matter is, around the world, governments on the whole don't particularly want to hear from their back. Oh, is it the much. same in the UK then? No, they don't want to hear. Exactly. They don't want to hear from the Surprise, They surprise. probably wouldn't admit it quite so explicitly or as bluntly as I'm about to state it. But if truth be told, governments take the view that the backbenchers are there to mm. vote through the legislation and to Absolutely. do it as they're told. Now and again, and they to be bullied a little? Well, I think there is a bit of that. Yes, I do. I think that they will say, look, do as you're told or your career's over. And I think they will sometimes say to a member, I want you to speak in this debate, and there'll be a reason for that, which isn't about helping a member, it'll be about Absolutely time the same in Pakistan. Nothing's, helping the nothing's different then. And so, you know, the, the government whip mm. or the minister will say, I want to speak from you in 10 minutes, not a moment less, and not a moment more, or whatever. Or, alternatively, you're planning to speak, but we don't want you to speak. Yeah. We don't need you to speak. We haven't got time for you to speak. We simply want to ram this through. Your role is to sit there and nod in the appropriate places yeah. and then go through the division lobby and ask for. By contrast, in opposition, yeah. the only weapons the opposition have got, because they've it's got the power, floor. It's is the time and argument. Yeah. And the time seat. and debate. Yeah. Time and the opportunity yeah. to put a different point of view. Yeah. So very often the opposition will encourage MPs to speak. Mm. And what I found, and I think other intakes House of Commons have found this. What I found as part of the 1997 intake was that, with no disrespect to some of my older and more senior colleagues, some of them who've been there a long time, although they were probably perfectly good MPs, didn't have a great thirst to speak on a very regular they basis. Did. No. Whereas it was the newbies yes, who were jumping up and down and wanting to ask questions. And wanting to make a difference. And we wanted to make a difference. And if truth be told, we wanted to make our mark. Yes. And so, I thought this is great, you know, we just have to accept the fact that the electorate that turfed us out of office and the Labour government under Tony Blair was in office with a huge majority. So what could we do? All we could do was question, probe, scrutinise, challenge, contradict, argue, expose, etc, etc, etc. And I tended to feel, well, part of my responsibility is to be a parliamentary warrior. I came to be known... Warrior, I like that. Well, I came to be known as Zebedee. I, I don't know whether this what is familiar in the East, but there used to be a children's television program when I was very young in which there was a character called Zebedee who was a little 
insect who would bounce up and down all the time. Okay. And so I would jump up and down asking questions and people would call out, boing, boing, meaning up and down. So before know. order came into place, this came into place. This came into place yeah, you're first. you're very famous for your order. Well, that came later. When you became speaker. That came later when I became speaker, yes. The responsibility, as you know, of the speaker in any parliament is it's to keep order. order. And so that might be a question of reproving or reprimanding or remonstrating with a particular member for disorderly conduct, or it might be... I wonder how many times you actually said order in your career. 14,000. You, they've actually 14, counted. Are you serious? Well, I think it was probably done electronically. I don't yeah, suppose some poor by the election in council didn't yeah, yeah, individually, but I remember being told at the end, I'd never asked and I didn't know, but it was reported that I had said order 14,000. I think my favourite word in parliament and politics was um, Marura, and Marura means the people. It, of right. course, again comes from Hittai. Um, and it just, again, everything was to do with the people. Yes. And my constituency, I mean, you, you obviously came from Buckingham, mine was a reserve seat, and I, I took care of the entire country. Because what, well, I'll just explain that concept. Yes, the reserve, reserve seat are uh, women who, who are being encouraged to come into Parliament, so get the gender uh, gap yep. in Parliament. And, um, you know, 33% of women uh, on reserve seat, which was um, a good initiative of President Sharon in mean, those days. Yep. Um, and um, and so we came sort of in. And numbers of people? For the benefit of our listeners, I mean, I have 75,000 or thereabouts constituents. It depends, you know, some constituencies are really large back home. And I think it's the same all over the world. Some could be 500,000, some could be 100,000, some could be less, more than that. So it really depends how the constituencies have been fixed in, in terms of on ground. And it sometimes shuffles as well. But my point is that I wasn't, of course, I'm very proud to be from Twitter. Um, uh, which is again sent, but my, my concept of constituency was anywhere there was trouble, or anywhere there were vulnerable people, I would just just get them by road, by flight, by by whatever. And I travel. I mean, if you, how many times was order you know said in your career was fourteen thousand? I can't even the amount of miles I must have done yeah. back and forth and back and forth and crazy hours on the road, especially in my opposition days, but again in my in my um, ministerial days. Um, just being with the people, and that's... But when you were a member of parliament and before you became a minister, yes, I know that the plight of impoverished women was a matter of importance yes. to you, and you could champion the cause of greater assistance for those people. But presumably, you couldn't take up the individual cases of people who didn't live in your constituency. Oh, we could. Did you you we could. could. Yeah. Because in Britain, you can't. Do oh, you that. can't there's do a, that. Well, there's a very strong convention. Yeah, it's not a law. It. But there's a convention in the UK Parliament that you don't deal with oh, other people's okay, something I learned today. So if somebody writes to you... Oh, you can't deal with it because that, con that parliamentarian opinion, must... You can write okay. back and say, I agree with you, I don't. Okay. If somebody in another constituency asks for your help with you their problem, it's considered very bad form. Okay, so there's some form of discipline. In a way, it's advancing on our concept, you know, uh, that parliamentarians need to deal with their own constituency's yeah. problems. Uh, and that person from that constituency is responsible. So it's yeah. a bit like ownership, which is good. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. In fact, I, I think that's one of the reforms that we can discuss later. I mean, sometimes on. people would say to me, well, I'm writing to you, Mr. Burke, because I've heard you on the box, mm. I've seen you on BT Parliament, mm. or I approve of your views, yeah. or whatever. Or they would say, my own MP is useless. Ah. I don't approve But you couldn't do... You and could do that much and you could help. do that. And I did, I'm afraid, yeah. always have to say, look, I can exchange mm. letters with you but not you're expressing honest. opinions. But if you're telling me you've got a problem and you need help, the fact that your MP, in your opinion, is very good, I'm afraid, is just too bad. You know, you've got to campaign either to get a better MP or to get the existing MP to perform better. But makes I'm afraid sense, you can't have me acting for you. Sense. Because otherwise you have a situation where it will be a kind of anarchy, mm. a kind Absolutely. of legalized free fall in which we just all, all over the place. on behalf of anybody who wants it. So Makes we sense. don't have that. Me, I didn't have that uh, that kind of uh, discipline. So I, could, I, yeah, yeah, I could travel anywhere in the country and I could pick up any course. And I think my, my fellow colleagues from the other constituencies were quite happy with me taking up their human rights issues because some of them were not so bothered on not so, bothered about so, them, so yeah. they were like okay Marvin's here she'll handle it she's part of our team in any case so yeah. it's it, it was fine you know yeah. but I, I I specifically zoomed in on vulnerable it could be anything 
which was, so it wasn't, it was by and large the women, yep. uh, it was the disabled, it was, you know, um, it was the vulnerable. And, and it took me places where I don't think anyone in Pakistan has had the opportunity to be, you know. I think we need to develop these themes yeah. in the course of our recordings. Oh, we will be, we and will we will definitely talk be about talking some about of our about individual them. battles. So Absolutely, we will be. You know, particular groups yeah. of people yeah. who we felt have perhaps been neglected, yeah. denied a voice, and in need of more effective representation. Actually, that kind of carried through. So when I um, when I left PMLQ, let me just give a bit of a background. I left my political party, uh, PMLQ, because they went into government. Yeah. But I, most people are happy going into government. They get they get ministries. I would have gotten a ministry, but I actually, you know, sacrificed. And I said, no, this is not right. I don't wish to go into government. We are in opposition and. I don't think they were going into government for the right reasons. So I stepped back and, and I actually resigned from my seat, which was the first. So that was really good for my political career as such. A lot of people say that because I actually took a step back and I said, no, I'm not going into government. I'd rather stay in opposition and I'd rather speak my mind. And um, and then I joined PMLN um, and I, and again, they were in opposition when I joined them. Um, but then we made it to government eventually after two years of me joining them, one, one or two years. And, um, and then I got a chance to be a first uh, parliamentary, um, in the information um, chairperson, uh, the parliamentary committee yep. for information. So that was an interesting experience. How long was that? That was um, just about a year. And then I was offered a ministerial post and I was asked to lead Pakistan's uh, largest social safety net, the Benazir Income Support Program, which was completely me yep. because it was, and I think the Prime Minister at the time, Navashri, was really, he, he was very spot on in the, in the kind of responsibility he gave me, and I'm grateful to him for that um, because it was truly something that I had been doing all my life. I had been taking care of the women, and, and I got an opportunity. And you know, we talk about politics and opposition, politics and government. When you're sitting in the executive branch, the power of the green pen, as we call it. Do you also have the power of the green pen? I wonder if you, if you do. But the power of actually making decisions yes. and actually delivering. I'm not about that particular expression. We. Our minister signed with the green pen, so we call it the, the power of the green pen. No, we've got a concept of the, what we call the green ink brigade. Okay, and maybe the green it's ink brigade is made up of people who write to you with pretty bizarre ideas. Oh no, no, no. So, no, for example, they think that they've spotted a UFO. Or, oh dear. And they, reckon that they saw the Loch Ness Monster the previous day and interesting traditions. Some very strange. We should have a session with our viewers on traditions. On traditions, yeah. But no, the power of the green pen yeah. is important. And okay, so I'm not familiar with that particular expression. So basically it was but that yeah, just the exact you've, you've got the power to decide. You can make decisions. You don't need to happen. be screaming and shouting in Parliament. You don't need to be arguing and you can just take a decision and you can deliver for the people you need to deliver for. It's 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 an incredible incredible feeling to deliver. And I think that looking back, you know, you must feel very proud that you had that opportunity. I'm humbled, yes. You know, and that you made a real difference because having a set of views, hmm. subscribing to a core principle, those things are important, but without power, I'm afraid they don't deliver change. True. And so, you know, I would argue, for example, in relation to the Labour Party and Blair's leadership, which is a matter of great controversy, that they're dying to hear your experience with four prime ministers. Well, there's a powerful argument to be made in favour of Tony Blair. He's often criticised and demonised in many quarters, and there are people, for example, on the left, who say, well, he wasn't sufficiently left-wing. He should have been a socialist. He could have been much more radical, and so on and so forth. But the attitude I think Tony Blair took was. The Labour Party had got used to losing and losing and losing and losing, and he was sick of losing. And I think he also made the judgment, for which I think there is considerable evidence, that Britain is not a very left-wing country, and that if the Labour the Party, time. no, not at the time, and even now, I'm not convinced it's a very left-wing country. It's quite the middle of the road, and it sometimes elects Labour governments and more often elects Conservative governments. But I think Tony took the view that if Labour was to win. It had to demonstrate that it could be different, it could make a change from the Conservative years, but it had to demonstrate that it wasn't a threat to business, to enterprise, to the profit motive, etc. And over a long period, Labour had tended, if you like, to frighten the horses. Labour had always been unpopular with the media because the media was run by very Conservative minded people. But Labour was also unpopular with a lot of ordinary voters who 
wanted to get on, who had an instinct mm. to advance, who had a sense of aspiration, and felt that Labour wasn't very sympathetic to aspiration, that Labour was interested in looking after the underdog and caring for people who needed help, but didn't really have any sense of aspiration or material advance of wealth creation, of business success, of entrepreneurship and so on. And I think really the success of the Tony Blair years was that he was able to hold on to the core labour vote, but he was also able to appeal to quite a lot of people in the middle and to demonstrate that he wasn't a threat to the free enterprise world. That's important and so to be seen as not being a threat. Um, he was effective in yeah. that sense. Now, you know, as I say, there are people who criticise and make the point that he could have done much more. But I think his argument would be, well, I got us into government and I kept winning. And by getting into government and continually winning, we were able to do things. We were able to, to be, improve sorry schools. Sorry to interrupt, but he well. seems to be one of your favourite prime ministers out of the four. Am I right? Well, I served in Parliament with five. Five, was it? Okay, but at score for Four speaker. during my time yeah. as Speaker. Actually, Tony Blair, I didn't, oh, you didn't have during my time as Speaker. And how would you rate them? Well, the five that I served alongside were Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, David Cameron, Theresa May, and Boris Johnson. I would say by a country mile, Tony Blair was the best. I recognise that that may be controversial in some quarters because Even people better. tend to have very strong views about Tony Blair, and a lot of people have been coruscatingly critical of him over the Iraq war. Yeah, and internationally. Internationally, there are a lot of people who are totally unreconciled to him, and probably remain unreconciled to him. But I suppose my point is that he was an extremely effective campaigner and he was thoroughly strategic in his approach to government. He had a very clear sense of what he wanted to do. And I think that's important, isn't it? And we're, we're going to it. talk about leadership, and that yeah. is something I'd like to come back and on. And was he decisive? Was he decisive? He was hugely decisive. Okay. And did he have strong convictions? And he certainly did. In fact, towards the end, there was almost a sense in which he had a surplus of convictions, mm. if that's possible. In other words, he felt so strongly mm. that he was doing the right thing that he would sometimes find it difficult to listen to discordant voices. So he certainly wasn't somebody who procrastinated or did or sat on the fence or couldn't find an opinion. On the contrary, he had very clear opinions, motivated by principle. He had a game plan as to how to achieve what he wanted to achieve. And in my opinion, he That's was the best counts, of the Prime Minister. It's it what counts. And you know, you only get so long, and in his case he had ten years, and mm. he did make big changes, improving public services establishing a national minimum wage, providing additional care for people at the bottom of the pile who needed it, legislating against discrimination directed at the LGBT community and so on and so forth, in favour of gender equality. So he did make a big difference. I think Gordon Brown, who took over from him, was extremely bright and is a very bright man, and in my opinion has been a very successful Chancellor of the Exchequer, but I think Gordon had two problems. One. He inherited office as Prime Minister during the world financial crisis. He was actually quite well equipped as a former Chancellor to cope with that, but the climate was unfavourable to the government of the day. People were starting to get fed up with Labour. He came in at the end and people's patience was wearing thin. And I think I would say that although Gordon is extremely intelligent, he wasn't a natural communicator in the way he took their vision and he didn't have the same success. And David Cameron was very fluent, very articulate, very but. dexterous at the dispatch box, but completely unstrategic, rather too laid back, mm, relentlessly work, tactical in mm. every situation. In other words, if there was a choice between strategy rather than mm. tactics, he would choose, he would choose tactics. Exactly. You know, flying by the seat of his pants, getting through mm. the day, and he tended to rely on his natural ability, and he does have a lot of natural ability. But my view is that he was rather flippant and lightweight. And I'm afraid he will go down as, in history as the Prime Minister who led Britain out of the European Union by accident. Oops. By accident. He was the person who decided there should be a referendum on Brexit. And my own view is that that was a terrible mistake. Mm. But I didn't think David Cameron was or is a bad man. I just think he wasn't a particularly successful Prime Minister. Theresa May was completely unimaginative. It was wooden as your average coffee table as Prime Minister, but she was honest and motivated and by the spirit of public service. It is important, you know, I think she was trying to do the right thing. Now we come finally to, to Mr. Your favorite. Alexander <laughs> Boris Defecting Your absolute favourite. 
and they're dying to hear more about it. I have to Give say, was the worst of the Prime Ministers mm. with whom I served. I think he is not strategic. He doesn't think things through. Again, we're talking about strategy. He doesn't, do the de that. He doesn't think about strategy in any significant way at all. He doesn't do detail. He doesn't do the homework. He doesn't do the briefs. He can't help it, or they should be able to help it. He had a very privileged education. How does he manage? He, he doesn't the read the briefs. Poorest. If I wasn't to read my briefs as a minister, well, I wouldn't I manage. Mean, he just muddles through. And he's the poorest public speaker of any prime minister that I've known. Mm. I mean, I used to think, I just sat there quietly listening when he was prime minister and speaking from the... You weren't that quiet backwards. with all the orders, orders, and orders. Well, I suppose I had to call for orders. Oh. But he, I, I sometimes thought, for goodness sake, man, spit it out. Because he would stand there saying, I, 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 um, 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 ah, 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 so well, they're not all eloquent. They can't all be eloquent. Well, I think it's quite important for a prime minister yeah. to be eloquent. No, it's true. And you know, you don't have to be a Gladstonian orator or an Israeli orator or an orator in the school of Demosthenes or the ancient Greeks. But I think it's a bit of a problem mm. if you're sort of humming and whoring your way through your sentences. But I think actually there's a bigger issue with Johnson, and that is, in my view, he lacks integrity. I think he's not an honest character. He's capable in the sense that he seems to be good on the stump when campaigning. He seems to have a sort of blokish image, people think he's rather fun. Originally his name was Alexander Forrest, but he switched that round and he's always been known in that life as Boris Johnson. His name is unusual and a lot of people just call him Boris and I'm told that around the country he often attracts an interest that previous Prime Ministers didn't. Even his appearance is a bit different, you know, his the hair. blonde hair, the shaggy hair, and tie that's usually on the wrong way around, or mm. isn't properly done up, or whatever, just makes him a figure of interest. Mm. But my sense, and I may be wrong, but my sense is that although at one point, two years ago, he was very popular, he's now becoming very unpopular. And I think the evidence of Prime Ministerial trajectories, if I put it this way, Marvi, is that their popularity doesn't normally go up. It may start down. high mm -hmm. and it will then go down. It's difficult for it to go up if you've well, done things well, which haven't worked. Yeah, I mean, apart from anything else, if, if, if we're real careful, success well, well, yeah, and if we're candid well, with each other about it, you know, I mean, I've been very critical of Johnson, but let's be candid with each other about it. Governing is difficult. It is. Some problems are insoluble or intractable. Some are partly soluble, but only over a long period. It's a very mixed picture. In other words, delivering sound policy, which is good for the country and popular, is a huge challenge. There are lots of things that need to be done. I, I want to say something here properly. before I lose it, and I, I lose that thought. Um, um, I want to say that, you know, when I was in opposition, I would pick up absolutely everything. Like I said, hundreds of like calling attention. But when I came in government, I realized my limitations as to how much I could actually deliver. And then I think I started prioritizing. And I think in any uh, kind of situation, whether you're on the corporate side or you're in, in an IFI or, you know, currently, as you know, that I'm with the World Bank and yep. like, with the Partnership for Economic Inclusion, I'm on their advisory. So in any situation, you need to be able to prioritize. You can't get it all. You can't, you can't win them all. You need to pick your battles and you need to make sure that you win those battles. So I think government teaches you on what you can deliver and what is potentially not possible in the short, medium term and what could be a long term you know, solution perhaps. So from that point of view, and you know, coming back to my experiences with prime ministers um, in Pakistan, but I think I would rather focus on their, on their, um, on the, on their actual skills and their characteristics. I, had, I also had four, uh, happened to have four, two in my opposition days and two in my uh, you know, ministerial days. I'll pick on the first and the last. Um, the first one was Yusuf Raza Gilani, and I think what I want to pick on him for is that he was a good listener, and he was always, always there. I would create, I would have an issue, which was in the middle of nowhere in Pakistan. I would call him, and he would return his call in one hour. Now, as a junior MP, a junior member of Parliament, um, to have the, the prime minister respond to you, well, I would be creating quite an issue on the streets as well. Uh, you know, if, if he wouldn't, so he had to, I suppose. Otherwise, there would be, you know, there were serious kind of ah, protests. The there's Marvie the, Menace. Yeah, the, the, the protests the on the streets. Yeah, well, the protests on the streets. But the point is, he would listen, he, was, he would respond, he would resolve. So, yeah, we would pick up issues, but there was someone who would actually resolve 
So that's important as my first phase. And the second one I want to pick up on is my, my the last Prime Minister I worked for, who was Shahid Khatan Abbasi. And he was, I think I want to talk about why he, he was important. In, in cabinet, he would listen to absolutely everyone. And there were 40, 50 of us, 40, I think, yeah. Um, and well, only four women. But nonetheless, gender, gender gap, yeah. Yes. Um, that but, needs to yeah, well, you know, Pakistan is quite good. We've had the first prime minister, woman yeah. prime minister, Benazir. Yeah. We've had a yeah. woman speaker. We've had a lot of women. So yeah. there is an emphasis on yeah. that. I'm very proud about Pakistan so. and, yeah. uh, you know, good women. At least there's a movement towards that and good women legislation as well. But coming back to Shahid Khan Abbasi, he was, I, I want to say that he listened to absolutely every single opinion around the huge table of the cabinet. And then he would, then he was decisive then you would not waver. So I think that's important. Yeah, you listen, but take a decision. Don't yes. let things get, you know, don't have things pending forever and don't put things in committees. Do you also have that yeah. problem of putting things in committees? If, if you don't have a... I think it's a yeah. way of... Delaying, isn't it? Delaying and relegating yeah. things on the back It's not responsible. And, and the corporate side does not have I can recall a number of times during my period as speaker when it was suggested to me and? that I might put something before a committee. And I thought, I smell a rat here, <laughs> I know this is a way of trying to bury it. Yeah. And I remember very early on with one particular reform, I was determined to create a nursery in the House of Commons. Oh, yes, I read about paid that. Paid for by MPs mm -hmm. and staff to broker a better work life balance. And there was one member, quite a prominent member, who chaired a subcommittee in the House who was violently opposed to what I was intending to do. And he didn't say so explicitly, but I sensed it. And he said to me, Mr. Speaker, I think it's very important that my committee should take a look at this matter. And I decided against because I knew exactly what was afoot. Mm. I knew his idea was trouble. to take it in front of his committee, and they would then produce a report saying it was a thoroughly bad idea and it shouldn't happen. Mm. And I decided against it. And he was very annoyed about it at the time, but there was no rule that said I had to put it before his committee. Okay. There was no rule, I wasn't making any rule. Yeah. And he objected and said, well, it should have come before my committee. And I said to him, Stuart, I'm sorry, I want to make progress. The strategic governing body of the House of Commons is the House of Commons Commission, on which you and I serve, my chair, Mr. Speaker, and the Commission can make a decision. In the face of all the information, and it can decide whether to go ahead or not. But I think the truth of the matter was that he knew I had a majority on the commission, he had a majority on his subcommittee, and so he wanted the matter to be decided by his subcommittee. And I thought, you are joking, sir. That is not mm -hmm. going to happen. The House of Commons Commission is going to decide this matter, and it's going to decide it soon. Now, was that Dictatorial? No, because there was no rule. It was just a question of making a judgment as to how to proceed. And, and delivering thought, on the idea I want to of get the on nursery. With it. Exactly. I just want to get on with it. You know, it was obvious Same. to me. You need he, to deliver. He, you need to. He get wouldn't have minded some, if there'd been another ten yeah. years discussion of the matter, as yeah. long as nothing happened. Whereas I took the view. I think we discussed it. If I remember right, over a period of about six months. Mm -hmm. And I thought I had in my mind this notion. I thought we've got to decide before the election. To sign a contract to get this uh, constructed, and that is exactly so coming back to decisiveness. And now, finally, and I listen to all yeah. the views, yeah, but in the end, yeah. I knew what I wanted. That's important in terms of leadership, of and uh, we will be talking about that. I want to ask you the, the hot seat question now and, um, and, and also respond on the same. Um, what keeps you charged? What keeps you going? What makes you wake up and go and make it happen? Well, I suppose after spending just over two decades in Parliament, it's the sense that Parliaments need to be better for their people. I think there are big policy challenges around the world, from climate change to the fight against global poverty and the challenge of delivering social mobility. And it's a huge generalisation because some countries are doing better than others. But frankly, we're not doing as well as we should. And in my own country, you know, it pains me, it makes me genuinely sad when I think that we are still one of the richest countries in the world, but there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people who are having to choose between eating and eating. Mm. Or and are homeless. Right. Or are homeless. And in the streets of know, it is up to parliaments, frankly, to hold their governments to account mm. and to try to construct legislation 
that will serve Republican interests. That is, after all, in the end, what it's all about. Not Absolutely. about who holds no, which agree. office or Absolutely. which other office, mm -hmm. who is a member of the cabinet or who is not a member of the cabinet. It's about, does the polity work? And do the career politicians, the professionals who are entrusted with power, or even opposition to power, make a difference? And so, I don't think there'll ever be a final solution. No. But it's a process, that, isn't it? It's a process and we're rather than a process. Back. It's yeah. a process rather than a fact. Right. But what you want is to see a process mm -hmm. of continual improvement, improvisation and improvement. I mean, I, if you were to ask me that, I would say that um, there's so much chaos that you see in the international world order right now. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there's not much order, but there's chaos. There's plenty of chaos. Yeah. And um, we'll talk about why there's chaos in the future episodes. But today I just want to say, um, and I'm just going to introduce the subject a little. I, I've seen so much chaos um, everywhere. Um, and uh, what is important is it's not just socioeconomic, political chaos, but it's the question of are we utilizing? And that's what gets to me. And it's, of course, coming from my mission of the tribe, yeah. uh, delivering for the most vulnerable yeah. immediately, wherever. And Alam Sabah Bakhtari, meaning it's the world that you're looking at. It's yeah, not, yeah. I, I'm not focused on one little, you know, territory and the state's boundaries are not so important to me in the sense that we're looking at humanity. Yeah. Um, and therefore, um, what, what's important is 50% of the population. It's all about the human uh, workforce, isn't it? Uh, I mean, you could say that, yeah, it's about energy, it's about conflict, it's about all of that, it's about climate change. But at the end of the day, it's about um, human workforce. And if 50% of them are not completely adequately utilized yeah. in the way yeah. that they should be, yeah, yeah. then we have a serious yeah. problem. And we do have a problem. Well, it's a terrible waste. It is. It is a wasted resource. And, and if prime ministers and leaders can look in and zoom into the GDP growth rate impact, that you have when you have half the workforce not delivering as what they should be. And that's, I think, the women empowerment agenda that I keep talking about and we've discussed with the, the two of us as well, the grand strategy for women empowerment. So that's what keeps me going, that there must be some magical grand strategy for women empowerment. And, and I believe there is. And you know, I, that's my fifth book that I'm writing that I shared with you. Um, that you need to have a few causes that you get right. And then perhaps you solve Maybe not 80 percent, maybe 70 percent of the world's greatest women empowerment uh, problems, yeah. and you need to zoom in on the critical aspects of that. So again, the workforce, the the, the human capital as such, women, um, and then making a difference. Um, I mean, I've done legislation. I've done. I've run that safety net for six million women. Yeah. With the one point huge. It's huge. Yeah. I mean, that's why you gave the award. Uh, but you know, it, uh, you, it was, you, you can. I know it's a. Uh, in a sense, a hackneyed phrase, and it may be a phrase that cloys in some people's minds. But the truth of the matter, Marvi, is that you made a difference. Well, we try to make a difference. A you difference. try to make a difference. I try to, and we are we're still continuing to, to make a difference. I believe because, well, I mean, it, it, it's a whole new world, the I five and the, you know the, the development world and the sustainable development and, and the rest of it. But what I'm trying to say is that. If we get these five issues perhaps right, which we will be discussing, we have perhaps solved a lot of uh, the gender gap problems as such. Now, if that to me is an exciting journey to be on. That gets me up, that gets me motivated, that gets me traveling uh, you know, different places. And, and I'm happy to be on that journey on a daily basis. You know, I'm charged and I, I, I don't think, I mean, I keep- No, you're fizzing with energy, that's obvious. I mean, I, I, I keep going back the only way I can keep anchored is when I go back to the Bitai's mission. And I, I've mentioned it so many times now, so the people are aware of it, that my constituency is fully aware of my mission. That you need to deliver one way or the other. It's the means, like, you know, Parliament was just a means to get there. But there's other ways of making a difference as well. There's other ways of, of being on that mission and, and delivering as such. So I'm, I'm exploring the other ways other than Parliament. And yeah. I'm really enjoying being out of Parliament. Yeah, you may and, come back at some point. Oh yeah, I mean, there's And no, as you know, that old energy in politics never say never. Yeah, absolutely. And does politics really get out of your blood? I don't no. think it does. No. no. I think it's in that your sense, DNA. it's analogous to people who want to be on the stage. In other yeah. words, if they want to be on the stage, it's compulsive. Yeah. They just have to do it. They can do no other. Mm -hmm. And I think that politics is either in the blood or it isn't. Now, yeah. of course, there are people who 
walk away from politics altogether. Of course there are. But it is very rare, in my experience, for somebody who has gone in politics to cease to have an interest in politics. It's very rare indeed. A person might decide to go off and pursue some other career, either voluntarily or because the electorate would persuade for him or her. Yes. That can be the case, and sometimes people who go out of Parliament don't come back, of course. But I think they probably still retain an interest and probably still want to, in one way or another, try to affect if not back in Parliament, if it was simply a pressure group or some campaign organisation or by writing some book which is transformative or whatever. In other words, people are either inclined to be difference and change makers or they're not. And if they are, they're not likely to stop it in the first place. Now, John, let's share with our viewers and our listeners what's going to be coming next so that they know exactly what we'll be discussing in the future episodes. Will we be talking about leadership models and leadership uh, models. You're, you're keen on that, I believe? Well, I'm interested in the concept of how to deliver change, mm. the way in which people use power. Mm. You hinted at it a few moments mm. ago, prioritization, yes. choosing your targets for concentrated yeah. power and attention. In other words, if I try to encapsulate a little bit of the theme of leadership, it's only a little bit of it. I would say it's better to do two things well than six things indifferently. Mm. And a scattergun approach, I think, doesn't work. I think it's much better to pick a small number of big ticket priorities mm. and to focus relentlessly and on And to prioritise. Um, other than that, progressive legislation, yes? Yes, we're going to talk about progressive legislation. I'm really keen on doing that. A passionate interest in that. Well, they're similar. Our interests are kind of similar. Human rights related. I'm happy to share this. Broadly speaking, yeah. it comes yeah. under the umbrella yes. of human rights. Exactly. And then perhaps media, social media, and then parliamentary controls and the controls on the executive, etc., etc. Sovereignty. You're keen to discuss sovereignty? Yes. And, and what does sovereignty in practical terms mean? You know, I think there can be theoretical sovereignty. Especially in this sovereignty. world order or disorder. Yeah, I think there can be theoretical sovereignty. That is to say, the theoretical right of a country to run its own affairs. Mm -hmm entirely according to its will, but there's the practical reality that we are operating in an interdependent world, a world of power blocks and of trade blocks. So a country might have formal legal sovereignty, but that doesn't mean it can just do what it wants without consequence or with impunity. In practice, decisions you make yeah. are impacted by what other countries do. True. And you know, most of the big global challenges, whether it be the fight against climate change or you know, trafficking, drug trafficking, mm -hmm. or conflict, these are challenges that require concerted international and mm -hmm. basic global action. They can't be resolved by one country after the other. And especially, I think, after the pandemic, what's been proved is that there's so much interdependency and the supply chains and the rest of it breaking yeah. down, etc., with this conflict going on in Ukraine. I think we will, we, we will be talking about, um, you know, sovereignty. Other than that, the demographic shifts, shifts I'm interested in, immigration, the kind of impact race, religion, and the rest of it has on the world, order or disorder. Yep. Um, CSR, DEI, diversity, yeah. Corporate social responsibility, yeah. diversity, um, ESGs. ESGs as well, as far as, yeah, yeah. Um, as far as the uh, corporates are concerned. And then I, I, I am very keen to discuss uh, Parliament and SDGs. How about you? Well, I'm always happy to talk about Parliament. And Parliament's role SDGs. is more of an oversight role than a policy-making yeah. role as such. In other words, we don't make decisions through Parliament as such. They're made by government. But I think the role of Parliament in scrutinising how governments are doing mm -hmm. and exposing them to the chill wind of independent scrutiny. That's so important and it has to be worked at and worked at and worked at all the time. And it's even more important when the government has got a large majority. At the moment in the UK, the government's got a large majority and the situation is different in different parts of the world. But I think one common theme is that Parliamentarians shouldn't see it just as their duty to vote things through without studying them. Sure. Parliamentarians should view it as their duty to ask questions, and to take an interest, and to consider whether something can be done better, etc. etc. And we come back to that notion again that achieving 
positive change is not a matter of an isolated act or a single high polluting initiative. It is an ongoing, constant, hard work process. And also multilateralism, how much it has worked, how it hasn't worked, yeah. and, and, and SDGs, coming back to SDGs, because those are the goals we've all signed off on for Agenda 2030. Um, of course, social movements that have come out of Parliament for democratization and for change and for positive uh, change as such, I, I'd like to touch on that as well. So there's a lot of things that we need to we've talk about. We've got plenty to discuss. Yes, we've got and plenty And perhaps we'll have speakers coming in and, and joining us and, you know. Well, that would be fun. Maybe yeah. there'll be other people who want to take part. Absolutely, we'll do that too. Well, it was a great pleasure. Parliamentary ponderings will continue. Parliamentary thank ponderings you, John. will continue. Marvi, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the questions you've asked. And incredibly important points that you've made. Yours has been a successful track record. We have a long way to go, John. executive member, my role was relatively secondary as no. somebody who chaired but I humble. wasn't a minister. But you ran parliament for 10 years, John. It's not a joke. Well, we tried to make a difference. We are. And we will continue to make a difference and we will keep pondering and we will do these parliamentary ponderings for as long as we can. Parliamentary ponderings must persist. Absolutely. Order. Order. <laughs> okay, bye-bye.